Good evening, and welcome to the 2022 Ina Levine Annual Lecture hosted by the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. My name is Betsy Anthony, and I'm the Director of Visiting Scholar Programs at the museum's Jack, Joseph, and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies. I would like to begin this evening with a thank you to the William S. and Ina Levine Family Foundation, and in particular, to its founder, Bill Levine. Bill is a former presidential appointee to the United States Holocaust Memorial Council and a longtime friend and supporter of the museum and the Mandel Center. Tonight's program and many others are due to the generosity of families like the Levines. We are so grateful for their thoughtful support. Tonight's conversation will present new ways of thinking about the Holocaust and innovative methods for research. As we'll learn, social scientists only recently started to address topics and themes related to the Holocaust. By incorporating theories and methodologies from psychology, political science, and sociology, to name a few, scholars can ask and answer new and different questions like, why did certain communities help their Jewish neighbors while others violently attacked them? How does the legacy of the Holocaust ripple into current economics and politics? And how is Holocaust memory being politicized to serve national interests? Tonight, we'll look at questions like these and we'll learn more about the social scientific research that addresses them and how by viewing this history through a different lens, scholars can deepen understanding of the causes and the legacies of the Holocaust. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lisa Leff the director of the Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies, who will guide tonight's conversation. Welcome, Lisa. Thanks, Betsy. And welcome to our viewers as well. Um, during tonight's program, we'd love to know where you're tuning in from. So if you can, please let us know what country or city or even university you're watching from by commenting in the live chat where we can see your comments. And of course, if you have questions as we go, you can put those in the chat as well, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of our conversation tonight. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jeffrey Kopstein. Jeff is the Ina Levine Invitational Scholar at the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies this year. He is a professor of political science at the University of California, Irvine, and he's the author of two books, three edited volumes, and over 60 peer-reviewed articles. Jeff's research focuses on inter-ethnic violence, voting patterns of minority groups, and anti-liberal tendencies in civil society. And he focuses on Eastern Europe and Russian Jewish history. All of these themes are featured prominently in his latest book, written with Jason Wittenberg, and it's called Intimate Violence, anti-Jewish pogroms on the eve of the Holocaust. Tonight, we will be talking about Jeff's work and more generally how social scientists across the disciplines are helping to broaden our understanding of the Holocaust by using innovative methods. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you very much for having me. It's an, it's an incredible honor. So let's begin um, with a basic definition. When we talk about social science, we're actually talking about a range of methods and a range of disciplines. There's political science, your home discipline, but also sociology, psychology, economics, anthropology, demography. Jeff, tell us, why have scholars across these disciplines been late to include the Holocaust as a subject of their research? It's a really good question. Um, individual scholars had, social scientists had before addressed the Holocaust, but taken as a whole, as a research community, they came, as you say, very late to the question. Just to give you some idea how late. The first panel on the Holocaust, devoted to the Holocaust at the American Political Science Association annual meetings, of which 10,000 political scientists gather each year. That first panel ever in its over 100 year history took place in 2011. And I know that because I organized that panel. And it's a really odd that this that it took so long because in many ways, the Holocaust is the index case for violence in the modern world. 
many concepts that we use in social science, genocide, human rights, our immigration regime, all of these originate um, from an attempt to understand the Holocaust and also an attempt to prevent something like it from ever happening again. As many in our audience undoubtedly know, the term genocide didn't exist until 1944, created by a Jew from Lemberg, today's Lviv, uh, who had escaped from Hitler's Europe. So, you know, this is a, such an important topic. The themes are so important in social science. So what do you make of that? Why hadn't social scientists written about it? Well, I think there are really two big reasons. The first is, um, our, the first is professional incentives. In political science, for example, if you want to make a wanted historically to have made a, a, a really big career within the discipline, you studied what political scientists considered to be the big important things. And those were largely dictatorship and democracy, that is the determinants of, of different regime types, why centuries are, some countries are rich and others are poor. Um, you studied Congress, you studied the presidency, but the Holocaust itself, and there was no shortage of Jewish political scientists from where you would expect, at least initially at any rate, um, research on the Holocaust to have come. But this topic was considered to be, by many, um, to be too Jewish, if you will. That is, if you engaged in that, you risk kind of sidelining yourself uh, professionally. And people didn't want that. They wanted to make normal, regular careers, especially as a lot of Jews entered political science, entered academia in general after 1945. But there's a second reason, I would say, and that's the evolution of the social sciences themselves. Social sciences, as many of you know, are often rooted in the present and in present concerns. And the question became, especially as the years passed, was how could the Holocaust not be seen purely just as history, but as, as relevant for today? But even more important and connected to that was social scientists are generalizers. They like to theorize about things. But the Holocaust, of course, is one big thing. And how do you actually have a theory of one big thing? And, and that became very difficult. There are, of course, there is, of course, genocide, and there are a number of genocides, but thankfully, actually very few genocides. So even if you had two, three, four, five, it's very difficult to generate a theory based on, as we would say in social science, N equals five. Um, you'd want, ideally, to make a generalization, if you think about voting behavior, many, many more cases than just one, two, three, four, or five. So what you make, what you say is making a lot of sense, but it's, you know, it's ironic or, or maybe just interesting. Holocaust historians, people working in the discipline of history, have actually used a lot of social science theory in their work. You know, um, to take one case, I think most of our watchers are probably familiar with Christopher Browning's la landmark work, Ordinary Men. Isn't this work drawn completely from social science theory? Well, yes, I mean, there are, and undoubtedly, indeed, there, and some historians have drawn from social science, usually in order to kind of explain their empirical research, things that they found in the archives or patterns that they've seen. You pointed to Christopher Browning, and um, Browning drew on um, Stanley Milgram's work, which many of our viewers will know, uh, was a, a psychologist um, in the early 1960s. And his experiments showed that people would follow orders to inflict pain on others um, when directed by superior authority. In this case, in his case, it was that the authority figures were people in white lab coats um, in psychology labs. Um, Milgram himself, of course, was influenced by the Eichmann trial in 1961. Um, and Eichmann, who was seen, at least at the time, pitched as somebody who was quite an ordinary German bureaucrat. And how would an ordinary German bureaucrat um, be induced to order this kind of horrible atrocities, right? The world's worst crime. Um, and Milgram was inspired at the time to try to use this to explain why Germans uh, participated in the Holocaust. Mil Browning drew from Milgram, and here we have a photo of, of uh, soldiers from Police Battalion 101 that, that uh, Browning was interested in. Um, Browning drew from Milgram to show how these these men of Reserve Police Battalion 101 were willing and able to get ordinary men from all walks of life to murder tens of thousands of Polish Jews. Based on post-war interviews done um, alongside war crimes trials, 
shows that the motivations of ordinary working class Germans, people from a cross section of German society were really about following orders. It was like Milgram said, it was small group behavior as opposed to anything else. Right, so even before social scientists are getting into the conversation directly, historians are using the theories coming out of social science to make sense of this history. And so indeed, in part, yes. Um, let's pause for a moment for me to welcome some of our viewers who have typed uh, where they're watching from in the chat. Uh, people are watching from Texas, from Ohio, from Tennessee. Um, we've got international viewers from Canada and Japan, um, from universities like University of North Dakota, and Jeff from your home institution, University of California, Irvine. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. And for those of you out there, please also, um, if questions come up as we're talking, please feel free to type them into the chat and we'll get to them at the end of our program. So Jeff, the occasion for our talk, for our conversation tonight is that social scientists have now started to include the Holocaust more and more in their research. Yes. What changed since 2011? Well, I think in the in the in the uh, first instance, the source base change. Political scientists and sociologists and economists and, and psychologists, we like to have lots and lots of data. And all of a sudden, um, in 1989, the Berlin Wall fell and led to the opening of archives in Eastern Europe in the former USSR. Um, there we have the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw, where I've I've used their archives myself. Um, so the Soviet archives opened up, at least temporarily in the 90s. Um, and now, obviously, it's very hard to access that. Um, the Ukrainian archives opened up really almost completely. And as you know, the US um, um, Holocaust Memorial Museum is working very hard to try to preserve um, those archives. All of this allowed for scholars um, also to talk to people from these countries, people who had survived, who had, who had witnessed um, the, um, the Holocaust. Most importantly, of course, most prominently is Father Dubois. Um, he worked on what is known as the Holocaust by bullets, which really consisted of Nazis and local helpers um, coming to town, these towns all over Eastern Europe, mostly in, in, in Ukraine, um, coming to towns and murdering Jews in mass graves. So that's reason number one, changes in the, the source base. But also there were really big methodological changes um, and this is probably perhaps even more important. As I mentioned, since there were so few genocides, this led to a really a rethinking of the Holocaust as um, many small events that only in their totality we add up to. And in retrospect, as one big event, nobody knew there was going to be a Holocaust in 1933 or 1938 at Kristallnacht or even 1941 when the, when the war started. And so what people can do now is what social scientists started to do is they started to look at these many smaller events and they can assess factors across nations, across time frames. Um, for example, um, there was intercommunal violence, which I've studied in the, in the, in the uh, first month of the war in 1941. There was, of course, residential segregation that occurred. There was um, in, um, also after 1941, but even before that. Um, there was stigmatization that occurred after 1933 all over Nazi Germany. These are separate instances that can be studied separately and compared with similar instances um, in different times and places, both in Jewish history and in non-Jewish history, in the past and in the present. Now, thinking about it this way, as simple as it sounds, is sort of revolutionary. You can ask new questions. Like, what are the conditions that lead to intercommunal violence in some territories, but not in others? And this really opened the door to, the, to, to social scientists, not just political scientists, but of course, sociologists and economists and anthropologists. It really was quite revolutionary. Right. So you've gotten away from the N equals five, and now you have many, many different cases that you can compare within the same event or with other events. A real innovation here opening up this history um, to the insights of political science. And I want, to, I want to turn you now to your own work, to how you do this in your own work. Tell us about that research that you did on the pogroms that took place 
after Germany invaded the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941. Well, of course, I'm always prepared to talk about my own work endlessly. Um, this is a book that I undertook with uh, Jason Wittenberg at Berkeley. We had read um, the work of a historian who actually was a sociologist at one time, Jan Gross, and he had written a book called Neighbors about a town in Poland, Jedwabne, where in his words, half the town killed the other half the town. And we looked at the weeks following, as you mentioned, following the start of Operation Barbarossa on the Eastern Front. Um, there we have soldiers from that front. Um, the Nazi Germany's attack, invasion of the Soviet Union. And we looked at literally thousands of cities and villages where locals um, um, either didn't or did attack their, their um, uh, Jewish neighbors. And this occurred in a very brief spurt in about a six week period. And what we found out of the 2000 or so locations um, in Eastern Poland, which eventually becomes Western Ukraine and Western Belarus, we found that in 219 locations, that is some places in about 10% of places, and these were only territories that had been occupied by the Soviet Union after 1939, when Poland was divided between uh, Germany and the USSR, you had locals attacking their Jewish neighbors. They were essentially given permission to do so by the German invaders. So we found that pogroms occurred in approximately 10% of all places where they conceivably could have occurred. That is where Jews lived side by side with their non-Jewish Polish and Ukrainian neighbors. So why did these pogroms occur? That question, we put it that way, why pogroms occurred in some places and not in others. We figured this could intrigue people who were not even really interested in the Holocaust, people who were interested, let's say, in lynching in the American South, where we know from the historic from historians that lynching did not occur in about a third of counties after the Civil War. Um, or Hindu Muslim violence in India. Why does why does intercommunal violence break out there? In some way, this episode this that occurs in 1941 resembles in many ways other instances of intercommunal violence because people did not know what would happen next. Right, so breaking it up into this smaller research question, not why did the Holocaust happen, but why did these pogroms occur in these circumstances actually allows you to move towards generalization, right? And you're asking why these places and, and not others. So, so tell us more about your process and, and more importantly, your, your findings here. So what we started to do, we proceeded in a very conventional manner in many ways, except it was a lot of work. Um, we, start, we first needed to figure out where these pogroms occurred. And to do that, right, and here we have a photograph from the Lviv pogrom that occurred on June 30th, 1941, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, we needed to find out where these pogroms occurred, and we looked at testimonies that were given by survivors. Um, mostly, we started with the 7,200 testimonies at the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw. These were excellent testimonies because they were taken right after the war when people's memories were still very fresh. And what we did is we figured we looked for mention of pogroms or mention of pogrom-like activity. Now, it's quite possible that we missed pogroms. That is, if the Germans just came back and killed everybody and no Pole or Ukraine or German ever testified that there was a pogrom, we could have missed it. So we look at the 219 as a kind of a, a minimum. So that's, we wanted to figure out where they happened and where they did not. And that's how we determined that. And we looked at other sources too, like Yizker books. We went to Yad Vashem and looked at their testimonies as well too. But the next thing we wanted to do is we asked, what kind of places were these? Were the places that had pogroms in that summer of 1941 fundamentally different in some kind of way than the places that did not have pogroms? So we started with very basic questions. Who lived there? We looked at census data, right? There was a census in Poland in 1921 and 1931. So we looked at how many Jews, how many non-Jews, how many Poles, how many Ukrainians, how many Germans, how many Belarusians lived in each place. We looked at socioeconomic data. To what extent were people illiterate? To what, to what extent were the Jews richer or poorer than their non-Jewish neighbors? And perhaps most interestingly, since I'm a political scientist, um, we looked at voting behavior. There were in Poland in the interwar period relatively free and fair elections, at least through the late 1920s and even into the 1930s. 
And we wanted to see whether there were pre-existing political divides that were a factor. We were very interested in, in was there anti-Semitism? So what we did is we looked for the performance of anti-Semitic parties. Now, the interesting thing is when I say, was there anti-Semitism? We know there was anti-Semitism, but here's the problem. Anti-Semitism was too evenly spread. That is to say, anti-Semitism was everywhere. It existed, you had anti-Semitic parties do well, both where pogroms occurred and they, where they did not occur. So that in itself, it may have been a necessary condition, but it could not have been a sufficient condition for why these pogroms occurred. Was it communism? After all, we know that the pogroms only occurred where the Soviets had occupied the area. Well, we looked for the vote for the communists on the this presumption that where the vote with the communists was stronger, you might expect more pogroms to occur there. People were angry. The problem was, is that while um, communists, the communist vote was spread and not, not all that evenly, um, where the communists did well, there were no pogroms. And that's because we argue the communists may have been um, um, dictatorial, authoritarian, but they were not necessarily really anti-Semitic or racist. As a matter of fact, it appeared that communism even stopped pogroms in some places, which really left us um, with a kind of conundrum of what causes it. Right. So, so maybe, you know, to, to um, get further into this, maybe you could walk us through how this played out in a particular place. I, I know you've done work on Lviv. There was a very violent program there, as you said, at the end of June 1941. And, and in our archives, we actually have some footage from that event that we can take a look at. Well, this is very famous footage, and you can see that the pogroms involve people being dragged out of their own um, their own apartments. Um, there was um, there is even worse footage than this. There, you, there's uh, it involved sexual depravity, sexual assault, lots of looting. Um, in short, on June 30th, starting on June 30th, about 4,000 Jews were brutally killed in this pogrom, um, and in subsequent pogroms in, in Lviv, um, they were beaten to death. Um, and it occurred in an almost, in, as one scholar has put it, in a kind of a carnivalesque atmosphere, right? Um, um, it, was, it was almost festive. People appeared to be smiling, having fun. In other pogroms, people, um, um, you know, church bells rang, music was played. Um, the Germans, um, we know, um, sent in um, mobile killing units, the Einsatzgruppen. And they sent them all over Eastern Europe, um, trailing just behind their soldiers. Um, and they, we know, tried to instigate these pogroms. And some places they succeeded, some places they did not. And they complained about that in their reports. But they tried, and they had trained Ukrainian nationalists in the run-up to the war, saying to the Ukrainian nationalists, look, you're going to invade with us, and you're going to get your own country but there's just one small thing you have to do for us in advance. You have to help us with the Jewish and communist enemies. Um, and this pogrom though, we now know, um, these pogroms we now know were not just carried out by the SS or Ukrainian nationalists. They were carried out by the broader community. And we know that because pogroms occurred sometimes before the Germans arrived, after they had left, or where the Ukrainian nationalists were otherwise spread very thinly upon the ground. Um, it's, it's otherwise pretty difficult to get people to do this. The Germans complained that they couldn't get people to do this, for example, in parts of Belarus. So it's not the Germans, it's alone. It's not the Ukrainian nationalists alone. It's also ordinary people. What are the factors accounting for this pogrom in Lviv, um, as opposed to, you know, places where it didn't take place. Well, I want to be clear that we're not saying the Germans don't hold responsibility here. Clearly, had there been no German invasion, there would have been no pogroms, no Holocaust, clearly. Um, but the problem is that while the Germans may have encouraged this behavior, it happened when they weren't present. Um, now, the Soviet presence, these, as we noted at the beginning, the Soviets had been present in these places and they had evacuated. And just before they had evacuated, um, in many places, there were secret police prisons and they had massacred, as in Lviv, they had massacred Ukrainian nationalists. Now, we now know not just Ukrainian nationalists, but also Poles and sometimes Jews. But when the Germans arrived, 
they brought locals into these prisons and they said, did you see? You see what the Jews have done to your people? Now go avenge them, right? But we also know that these pogroms occurred where there were no NKVD, that is the secret police, there were no so Soviet secret police prisons. So that could not, while the Soviet presence, like the German presence, may have, also, may have been a necessary factor, it could not have been a sufficient explanation. And you can see that people pull women out of their houses um, and they're well, people are well-dressed. And there's lots of these kinds of pictures which were actually taken by the Germans. Um, but looting was an important factor, but it could not have been the only factor. We could measure, we measured in these 219 pogroms um, lots of socioeconomic factors and we could not find um, socioeconomic differences which could explain why the pogroms occurred in some places and not in others. So what did we find? What appears to be not the only explanation, but an important underappreciated one? And that's the following, pre-existing political polarization, where locals and Jews voted for the same political parties. And it actually doesn't even matter which political parties it was. In the years running up to World War II, there were no pogroms. It appeared they appear to have occurred much more readily, number one, where there were lots of Jews, where the Jews did not vote for Polish or Ukrainian political parties, but where they voted for Zionist parties, mostly Zionist parties and sometimes Bundist parties. Now, what did this mean? What am I actually trying to say here? Um, what did it actually mean to vote for a Zionist party um, in the 1920s and 30s? It did not necessarily mean you were going to Eretz Israel. First of all, it was very difficult to go there. It was very difficult to actually go anywhere at this time. Um, the British were keen on not having any more Jews in the area, so the, the immigration quotas were, were, were very strict. Jews couldn't get to the United States or other parts of Europe very easily. They were stuck. What it meant to be a Zionist at this time in Poland was a very aggressive assertion of Jewish national identity. Right? Mostly what Jews, what the Zionists were lobbying for in the Polish parliament. Right? They wanted to have um, an end of Sunday closing laws because that would mean that Jews could not work on their own day of rest on Saturday or on Sunday. They wanted national education in their languages, in Yiddish and Hebrew, something the Poles had promised after World War I, but never really delivered on. And so you had, they wanted even to be a member of, of, of the government. The Yitzhak Grunbaum, the head of the, Pol the, the, the Zionists in Poland, he desperately wanted to be a member of, of a Polish government, but not one Jew, not one Pole, not sorry, not one Jew, not one Ukrainian, not one German, not one Belarusian would ever be a member of any government in interwar Poland. And so what this really meant is the, by voting Zionist, it showed in those places where the pogroms occurred that the Jews would never join the, the nation building project. And the locals, given the right circumstances, would use the opportunity as the Germans had afforded them to rid themselves of their future, their present and future enemies. Now, it sometimes seems ridiculous to us to say that, right? Because of course, given what we know about what would happen next, the Holocaust, what could this possibly have to do with voting behavior? But of course, that's only because we know the Holocaust was going to happen. They did not know in 1941, as the Germans were passing through and they said, do whatever you want with your neighbors. Nobody knew what would happen next. And so what we argue was an important factor appears in retrospect to us to be actually quite a reasonable explanation. And it, and it shows something that, you know, political science scientists have shown us before, which is that political divides um, create or sometimes reflect social divides that can be very significant in a society under stress. Absolutely. Under the right, under the right circumstances, and we can only use our imaginations in other times and places. Um, people have, you could use exactly this method in order to study lynching in the American South. You could look at the vote and who, if, whether the white vote in specific Southern towns was divided or unified, you could use exactly the same kind of thing. And, and lo and behold, other scholars have. We were, we're not alone here. Right, and, and you know, one of the amazing effects of um, broadening this conversation and looking at it in different ways that we're getting new ideas about why and how the Holocaust happened from other subfields. Indeed. Um, let me uh, take a pause and remind our audience watching at home that if you have questions for Jeff, 
please submit them into the chat and we'll turn to as many as we can tonight at the end of our conversation. I'd like to move you now, Jeff, beyond your own work to explore what other social scientists are doing. Um, there are social scientists who have studied the long-term effects of, um, of this period and of the mass killing of Jews on the communities in which it happened. What have we learned about those killing centers and their long-term effect on their regions? And it's a very important question. You know, they, if I had studied in my earlier work the causes of violence, in some ways, what we're what what other scholars are interested in who study the Holocaust are the consequences of all of this violence. Um, and let me concentrate just for a minute on two scholars that I want to highlight: um, Volha Charnish and Yevgeny Finkel. They've studied very closely this question of long-term consequences by looking at the Treblinka extermination camp in Poland, and there we have a, a photo drawn therefrom. Nearly one million Jews were murdered in Treblinka. It was set up in 1942 as part of Operation Reinhardt. Now, what Charnish and Finkel studied is the long-term political and economic behavior in the area surrounded by Treblinka. We know, and we know from testimonies, in fact, from the commandant of the camp himself, that the Jews brought with them to this camp, right, huge assets, belongings, property, jewelry, money. And we know that, that sometimes, um, frequently in fact, these belongings ended up in the hands of the locals by way of two ways. First of all, by way of prison guards, you, you, German and Ukrainian prison guards who went out into the local community surrounding the camp and spent or, or traded these resources. Um, or after the war, um, locals, came back to the site of the camp and dug them up and performed quite a grisly uh, task of looking through Jewish bodies for valuables that the Germans did not get. Um, now, what did um, Charnish and Finkel do? They looked at a series, in a series of concentric circles. And you, you see, a, this is a map from, the, from one of their articles, um, a series of concentric circles around Treblinka. And so here we see this map um, of, of the study around the camp. It shows it was placed equidistant between Warsaw and Bialystok near a rail station. And they found that communities closer to the camp experienced a sort of real estate boom for decades after the war. And there's quite a logical explanation for this, they argue. They said after the war, the locals, people who had benefited from this, um, they didn't know exactly what to do with all of these resources. It was difficult because in Poland, you could have, in communist Poland, you could have these resources confiscated and consumer goods would ultimately be used. So what people did is they invent, invested in their housing. And what Finkel and what Charnish and Finkel find is that the housing closer to Treblinka was more likely to have metal roofs by, it measured in 1988, decades later, and they trace it back through time. So it's not a one-time thing. Um, so in essence, right, it, they created kind of long-term differences. The peasants who were lived closer to those camps ultimately became richer and their children and their grandchildren became richer. And there, it was not just factors that were economic that were important um, for Treblinka, but they also learned that physical proximity to, to Treblinka affected current politics and voting, uh, the voting behavior of the residents nearby. Hmm. Um, I want to ask you, you know, it makes sense to me why the looting would have a long term effect. But why is there a political effect of um, being proximate to Treblinka? Well, when I tell you, it, it won't actually surprise you all that much. So it follows from the economic effect. Um, so what happens is they found also decades later, after communism, areas that were closer to, the, to, to Treblinka were much more likely to vote for an anti-Semitic party, the League of Polish Families, than in areas beyond it. Now, why? Well, there were really two reasons. The first is uh, they, they, they invoke, of course, a psychological a mechanism of cognitive dissonance that people felt bad. And so they tended to kind of blame the victims um, for their own, their own material success after the war. And then a much more practical um, motive, and that was they worried 
about that somebody might notice this and there'd be a call for reparations. And so these anti-Semitic parties, they were much less um, supportive of any form of reparations by the Polish government to Jews um, as a result of this one-time gigantic property transfer from the war. Now, if you think about it, this again, this has really grand implications for not just the study of Holocaust, but for other time, other places. We know of other instances in history. Think of the American West with giant property transfers over time. And we know that those had a huge and long lasting impact between people, between the distributional beneficiaries of this looting um, and the long term consequences of that. Think about the divides in our own country. Right. And it, it's chilling to think about the very long term consequences of an event like this. It's in incredible. Yes. I want to turn us to another discipline in the social sciences, sociology. There's a new generation of sociologists working on the Holocaust and helping us understand more about individuals and the factors that determine their choices and the effect of those choices. I want to ask you to take an, one example of a sociologist, um, Robert Brown. Can you tell us about his work? He's extremely clever. He's, a, he's and, and very hardworking. He's a sociologist at UC Berkeley. And Brown has done some fascinating research on the Holocaust in the Netherlands, and especially the issue of rescue. And here we have a, a, an image drawn, drawn from, I believe, Amsterdam. He wanted to know why, why some communities were more willing to protect local Jews during the Holocaust than others. And he did a great deal of heavy lifting along with some other scholars who've been working on this. He found records of 93% of Jews who were um, who had lived in the, in the Netherlands during the Holocaust. And he looked at which ones were assisted by local churches. And he geocoded every Jew and every church in the Netherlands um, by their address. And he found that which churches were closest, right, to the Jews who were saved. And what he found was absolutely fascinating. He found that Jews who were um, that, sorry, let me put it this way, churches that were local minority churches. So you had, the Netherlands were divided, the Netherlands was divided between Catholics and Protestants for the most part. Um, it was the kind of, there was a, there was a terror, it had long been divided that way. And Jews were much more likely to be rescued by Protestants in Catholic majority areas and by Catholics in Protestant majority areas than for any other reason. And um, this was absolutely fascinating because essentially what he found is that religious minorities was the key to understanding um, which group was most likely to save Jews. You know, it really shows you the power of getting a lot of data and figuring out a way of looking at it kind of systematically. You know, if, if, if you were a historian looking at these cases, you might um, say, looking at a case where it's a, a Protestant saving Jews, you would say, oh, it's because of their religion, it's because of their beliefs, right. or same about the Catholics. And looking at, um, both, you know, you're able to get this much, uh, much more nuanced interpretation that it's the religious minority status rather than the individual beliefs. And absolutely, and especially because, and I th I'm really glad you pointed to that, because the heads of both churches argued that Jews should be saved, right? So it can't be any difference in the ideology of the church, of, at least at the, at the top level. Um, it had to be something, and you'd miss that, as you said, if you only studied one or the other. Um, and so what he found, however, it wasn't the, the, the ideology or the theology of the churches themselves, but it was really minority status. Now, what was it about being a minority, right? That's, that's the question, right? Why did Protestants in Catholic areas and Catholics in Protestant areas help Jews? Um, for number one, minority churches were much more likely to have networks of trust among them because they were a minority. They were tightly knit groups. That is, they had the capacity. They had the capacity for the shelter of Jews, to prevent Jews from being deported to their deaths. But there is a second reason that's equally important, and that's empathy. They understood what it meant to be a minority, 
how precarious minority status actually was. Now, of course, neither of them were actually subject to, to um, death in the same way that the Jews were during the Holocaust. But what it really shows us, and it's an important thing, is that rescue was not about any particular religion or motivation. It was more a product of the local environment. And Brown offers a new methodology for thinking about this that's, if you will, portable to other times and places. And I can even just within the Holocaust itself, I can even think of, you know, the case of Le Chambon in France, which is similarly a Protestant minority group. Um, and, you know, this perfectly explains that that case as well. I'm sure Brown is well aware. Yeah, there's, there's for example, um, other scholars have pointed to the role of Baptists in Ukraine or Czechs in Ukraine. Again, local minorities that help out Jews under the right circumstances, um, even if in places they were majorities, they did not help out Jews, mm -hmm. right? And that's the really interesting set of findings. Yeah. So we're going to move towards closing here. Um, and I'm going to want to ask you a, a more general question. What do you think is going to be the future of Holocaust studies in social science? Well, I think it's only going to get bigger. And that's because the stigma that I talked about at the very beginning the fact that I could summarize so much, so many of these other studies, it really shows that um, the stigma is off. There's lots of, of, of political scientists, sociologists, anthropologists who are willing at least to devote a portion of their career, right, to um, using the all, all of this um, really valuable research that has been done before by historians and, of course, doing new research themselves. Um, and I think we can see that from in the case of, of uh, the case studies that I've talked about in the social sciences, that we have a lot to contribute to Holocaust research. I hope the historians pick up on, on our, our, I know you're a historian, Lisa, so I hope the historians also, also pick up on what we're doing, because I think we have a lot to learn from each other. And I think the discipline of Holocaust studies can only profit, can only benefit from the, the presence, from the interest of many kinds of researchers. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So I think now it's time to go to some of the questions that have been submitted via the chat. And please, if you've still got questions, chime in. Um, okay, here's the first one from a viewer named Edward, and let me read it. Um, he writes, you mentioned the carnivalesque or festive nature of some of this violence. In your opinion, what insights does this give us on the mindset of the perpetrators involved in these acts? Yeah, the, and it's a it's a hugely important question, and it's of course not an easy one to answer. It's very difficult to know what's going on in people's minds, right? Um, and um, I think one of the things that these pogroms show us is the entire gamut of human motivations comes into these holocausts, right? You have um, greed, there was looting, there was um, sexual depravity. Um, you have, of course, um, lots of, of, of anti-Semitic displays. So part of the pogrom rituals was forcing Jews to carry monuments, uh, Soviet era monuments to a graveyard and do a kind of a mock funeral for Lenin or Stalin, or even to sing Hatikva and carry Torah scrolls. So that was really kind of Jewish, whichever roles the Jews were forced to play. But really, I think the important thing of, of the research that I did with Jason is that it shows during these, you have the entire, how shall I say, the entire mess of human subjectivity, all of the possible motives. And those motives existed in virtually every town um, on the Eastern Front. But what our research shows was that those motives would only be acted upon in certain places. And in most places, they were not acted upon. It's not to say in places you did not have pogroms, they were not anti-Semites. You had lots of anti-Semites. But the question is, would you go out and then kill your neighbor? And so I think what this, this kind of carnivalesque behavior shows is the entire gamut and that film before that was a very short clip 
right? It really showed a kind of a giant gamut of human subjectivity. And it wasn't just any individual, um, it wasn't just kind of um, street people or the unemployed. You sometimes had lawyers or doctors or priests, um, the entire cross-section of society. I think the analysis of these pogroms show is that it defies the conventional categories of sociology. Scholars have for years tried to figure out who's more likely to harm and who's more likely to hurt Jews. I think what our research shows is that it's more likely to come in certain kinds of places where that behavior can be acted upon. I mean, you know, there's that book, It Takes a Village, right? And in, in that was trying to be, uh, that was written to show a good thing. It takes a village to raise a child. In this place, in this instance, in our pogroms that we've studied, it takes a village to actually harm people as well, too. And I can also imagine how anthropologists um, might contribute to that, um, you know, to an explanation of, um, of this as well. Let's take a question from David. David writes, hi, Jeff. Please explain whether you found pre-existing dehumanizing rhetoric and intercommunal violence in the communities where you then found the political divides correlated to the 41 pogroms. Let me read his follow-up as well. Were there political leaders calling for violence against Jews? What I'm asking is, can you be even more granular and lead us to nodes of violence, the individuals who swayed communities? Yeah, um, it's a really important question. It's part of the, our research has been criticized for, for this in a scholarly in a scholarly way. That um, are we saying that anti-Semitism doesn't matter, right? And the answer is no. Of course it matters. And let me put it to you this way: If everybody loved Jews, there would never be a pogrom. Right? But what we found is even where a lot of people really hate Jews, right? even where they don't like Jews, where they say bad things about Jews, where they have kind of traditional Christian anti-Semitism, or they have political anti-Semitism, that there's a Jewish conspiracy to, to take over the world. Um, that does not necessarily lead to violence. What we did in the case of our own work, we wanted to find very specific political parties where anti-Semitism was key to their platform. A lot of parties had anti-Semitism in, in, uh, as part of their, their appeal. But some parties were really quite anti-Semitic, not quite Nazi in the case of Poland, but very anti-Semitic, right? The, the case of the National Democrats uh, is, is an example of that. And we can actually look at how appealing the Social Democrats were literally in every community of Poland. And that is a, a pretty good proxy for the level of anti-Semitism, if you will. It's not perfect. And as, as David says, right, we can't get down into the individual level. Well, that might, I mean, remember, we were looking at over 2,000 communities of Poland. That might be important for other scholars to look at, and they should, right? We're, and other people should find different things than us. But I think what we've done here is we've kind of identified the first set of factors that people can start with. Um, but it's, it, it does occur, it does happen, that even in places where there were lots of people saying how bad the Jews are, how despicable the Jews are, et cetera, et cetera, all the kind of traditional litany of anti-Semitism, lots of those places did not have pogroms, mm -hmm. right? So it must be something else that's going on. And that's, we pointed to the communal level factors that allow these otherwise pretty widespread attitudes to be acted upon or not. So that's my that's my quick and answer, quick and dirty answer to a very important and difficult question. Well, here's another one. Um, how do you make sense of the fact that it was the Jews alleged Bolshevism rather than their Zionism that was the more common rationale for wartime pogroms in Poland? And all of those air quotes I was doing were from the, the yeah. question asker. From the question itself. That's a, it's also a very important question. One of the things that actually led us up to this research is we, Jason and I, had done a series of articles on Jewish and non-Jewish voting behavior in the interwar period. And there was always this idea, this prejudice, if you will, that the Jews were heavily communist. And what we found, we, we had village level voting data and village level uh, census data. So we could actually make pretty good estimations of the size of the Jewish communist vote. And we found that the Jews were actually not very communist, that vast majority of Jews, um, neither were all Jews communists, nor were all communist Jews. There, were, there was representation in the, in the leadership of the communists. But for example, the Belarusians were much more likely 
to support the communists than the Jews were, like four or five times more likely. Even the Ukrainians were more likely to support the communists than the Jews were. But it is true that when the um, so then the Germans invade, they accuse the Jews of they they say the Jews had been siding with the Soviet um, occupiers. Now it's true that when the Soviets were there, the Soviets tended not to discriminate on the basis of race and ethnicity. So there were Jews in the Soviet government, but not a disproportionate amount. And in fact, when um, when the Germans invaded, um, those former communists who had been Ukrainians or Belarusians were largely not targeted by the pogroms. They, the Jews were targeted, we maintain, this shows, as Jews, not as communists. Of course, in the Nazi kind of fantastical imagination, communism was a kind of Jewish conspiracy. All Jews were potentially communists, men, women, children, um, across, across the spectrum. But for our purposes, did you have the bare minimum of solidarity? You didn't have to have love. You needed a bare minimum of solidarity in order to prevent the very worst that would happen. And our argument is in those places where the Jews were determined not to join the local nation building project in the years, indeed decades before the Holocaust, they were most likely to be targeted when the opportunity arose. Um, I'm not sure we've nailed it down, but I think we've we've identified something important. It also allows you, you know, gathering all of this kind of macro data allows you to move beyond what people said. Um, there's, you know, to, so that you can know, is that justification or is that really why? Sometimes people don't act, don't know why they're acting the way they are. They just do. Yeah. And it's perfectly reasonable when you asked survivors after the war. It's interesting, if you look at the testimonies and you ask survivors after the war, why did, why did they do this to you, right? And they said, well, because they hated us because we were Jews. But when you look at the testimonies, the testimonies themselves are slightly contradictory on this matter because they say, look, we were getting along just fine with everybody, things were okay. And then here's the important thing, we were betrayed, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, they, now, if you think about it, betrayal is an interesting category because betrayal can only occur when there is pre-existing trust. Right. You could only it could only happen where people were already. I'm not saying they loved each other. Nobody ever loves each other. Right. But the question is, did they get along more or less? And in most places, that's true. It's not saying that Jews didn't want to leave under certain circumstances. Of course they did. But the vast majority did not leave. The vast majority were there. This was their home. Right. Things weren't perfect. They understood many people knew, you know, they had wealthy relatives or even poor relatives in the United States or in Palestine at that time before the founding of the state of Israel. Um, but the vast majority did not leave. The vast majority could not speak Hebrew. Even people who were Zionists, of course, they were Zionists in Polish or Yiddish. Right. Uh, in that way, the same way Americans are Zionists are Zionists for the most part in English. Right. This was their home. Right. So. Just because they, they don't say it, as you say, Lisa, does not mean it's not an important factor. They didn't fully understand. In fact, they were bewildered why people were attacking them. Mm -hmm. I've got another kind of more basic or psychological question about the violence that you've written about from Esther. She writes, didn't people lose themselves within a mob, losing all sense of right and wrong, of limits? 100%. And these pogroms, and they don't, it's not really captured by my voting data correlations at all, right? These pogroms tended to spin out of control. And people acted in all kinds of bizarre ways. When you actually start reading the testimonies, you'll see, for example, somebody, a Ukrainian guy is out there committing horrible atrocities. And then he sees somebody he knows. And he says, look, you better get out of here and go back to your apartment. Bad things are about to happen. He actually is a rescuer. And then before turning back to being a pogromist, right? They recapture their humanity for a moment. This, I think what these moments show us is human subjectivity. What, it, what we are as humans is a big giant mess, right? And um, you're not, it's not easily readable how people are going to act in these most extreme situations. This notion of a carnival, right? There's a, a very well-known story that a, a, a colleague of mine told me where um, somebody, a, a, a Jew who was not easily identifiable as a Jew was walking down the street with uh, his wife and they saw a Jew being beaten and what they, they looked back and he looked at her and she, he said, laugh. 
laugh because that will show that you're not Jewish. That will show that you're one of them. This is the kind of situation that people found themselves in where things spun out of control and people who would, you, you would otherwise not expect in a million years to have joined such a carnival of violence joined. So this, this kind of psychology of the crowd is very important, but it's also, I'll drive back to my own research. It's also important to realize that this psychology could only get off the ground in certain places, not in others. Right. Oh, here's an interesting question about your kind of experience of research. When you were doing your research, how cooperative were the villagers and village governments that you had to deal with doing, during your research? And I assume you also worked in larger places like Lviv, perhaps. Yeah. Um, for the most part, um, people were okay. I was very lucky in that I, I, I used mostly testimonies that I could draw from archives, which were in you know, places like Warsaw or the, or the Holocaust Museum itself or Yad Vashem. But of course, as a researcher, I wanted to go to some of these places and I did. Um, and I went and I visited my own, my grandfather's home, hometown in, in, uh, in today's Belarus. And people were by and large okay. There were some people were worried that I was coming to, to claim back property, but I assured them I, I live in California. I have no really desire to resettle or own property in, in Belarus or, or, or Ukraine or, Ukraine, um, or Poland. Um, for the most part, people were okay. I did present the research in a few places, a few small places, and people doubted. Sometimes people doubted that this had occurred. One person argued, you can't, you can't trust the te Jewish testimonies because they're emotional about this. Well, of course, how could they not be emotional about this? Um, but then I would say back to people, well, said, well, then you don't want me to trust the testimonies of bad things that happened to your people if they were given by your people, right? And so it, that definitely happened. People have an interest in... Um, in avoiding the kind of the bad things about history that make them feel bad. People tend to like to tell fairy tales to themselves about their nation's history and their behavior during the Holocaust. A lot of people claim that they had parents who were saviors or grandparents who were rescuers. Um, this is quite normal. Um, but for the most part, I didn't have that many obstacles to my, to my research. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's one last question. Were you able to tell whether any common sociological concepts like the level of anomie or, or disruptions from modernization contribute to, contributed to the likelihood of pogroms at the village level? Yeah, I, and I think there's no doubt that that's the case. Um, th I think that explains why, well, I, first of all, it partially explains why the pogroms only occur, or at least for the most part only occur. Um, in that episode from June 41 to August 41, that six week period, um, in places that had been occupied by the Soviet Union from 1939 to 1941. What had happened at that time? First of all, the Soviets destroyed local civil society, religious institutions, um, um, communal life in general, um, associational life, things like, you know, what would be the equivalent today of the PTA or soccer clubs. They were all kind of absorbed into communist um, um, institutions. And this kind of wrecked existing connections within the society that might have prevented pogroms. So I think there was a large degree of anomie. Of course, it also, the Soviets had deported much of the local intelligentsia, Polish, Ukrainian um, intelligentsia um, to um, Siberia and some Jews for that matter. The interesting thing is those intelligentsia and Jews who were deported to Siberia as bad as it was, were of course much more likely to survive the war than if they had stayed in, in, in any part of that area in Poland, Ukraine, Belarus. Um, so indeed, I think these conventional sociological categories of, of NOMI and modernization. I mean, you know, this was a, these were rural, this was a rural society for the most part, in which the Jews lived in towns. They were surrounded by local communities that were non-Jewish, and so it, indeed it was the case that the peasants brought in carts from the surrounding communities to loot Jewish apartments. Um, this was this was quite common, and this is, also comes through in the testimonies. So. This, these were societies that were in transition and the, the Jewish community itself was in transition, right? Some Jews were very traditionalistic, um, um, you know, Hasidic communities. Other Jews were, were much more modern. Um, the Jews of Lviv, as we saw in those pictures, 
were very modern looking. They didn't look that different from you and I um, here. And so I think these societies were going through all of these things that the, the, um, the, the questioner um, asks. I'm glad we're, an, we're ending there on, on the big picture, um, which, you know, reminds us that, you know, this is at the heart of, of social science is under, understanding these very big processes. Um, and that's where we started. Thank you so much for, for joining me tonight. This has been so enlightening. And, and thank you for inviting me. It's been a true kind of honor of my life to be the Levine Scholar at the Mandel Center and the museum for the year. So thank you. We've loved having you here. And on behalf of the Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies, I want to again thank the William S. and Ina Levine Family Foundation, as well as specifically its founder, Bill Levine, for their ongoing support. I'd also like to invite our viewers to learn more about the work of our center, including our annual fellowship program, through which we bring about 25 scholars to the museum each year to do research in our collections for extended periods of time. We'll post a link in the chat where you can learn more about this program as well as our other programs. Thank you to all of you watching for joining us tonight. We hope you will join us for future programs. Have a good night.